There's something I know about all of you. There's something I know absolutely without any shadow of a doubt about all of you that you're one of three places in your life. You are in a trial. You're coming out of a trial. Or you're going into your next trial. There's also something else I know about all of you because I as well am part of the human condition is that when you are under stress and when you're under difficulty, three things happen. Your intention, you're in transition, and or you're in trouble. And those things are the things alone that can make you change. And so the other thing that I know about all of you is simply this, is that all of us have had things going on in our lives, are having things going on in our lives, and have things going on in the future. So what do we do with them? What do we do with our trials? And you might be saying, well, so why should I listen to you? Well, let me just tell you a few reasons why I think that I've got a little bit of credibility in this, is that I've lived a lot of years on this earth. I experienced trials when I was very young. We, we moved nine times before I was 11 years old. I I lost a father and a brother who was a pilot who died tragically in a plane crash with my brother in the plane, and they burned to death, and it took three weeks to find them. I was eight. And so don't feel sorry for me. God is good, and we get to heaven, I'll introduce you to them. But, but not only that, in, in college I struggled for literally a year with depression, stuff going on in my head that I couldn't get out and thank God for Christian counselors like we make available for people here that are going through struggles in their lives because I know what it's like to go in that in, through that internal darkness. I know what it's like to lose somebody. I, I know what it's like to be so stressed out you're trying to figure out how to pay the next bill. I also know what it's like when you have a little bit more money than you used to have and the stresses and troubles that go along with that as well. As a pastor, I do what pastors do. <laughs> you know what pastors do? Somebody put it this way. We hatch them, match them, patch them, and dispatch them. In any kind of spiritual context, when people are born, there are things that are going on in their lives, and, and pastors are expected to be there. Well, I've been there in those exciting times when parents have held newborns in their arms, and then also I've been there at times when they've held children that did not survive birth. And I've held those babies in my arms as well, and ask God for the blessing of their lives, even though it was only in the womb. I get first place seat every funeral. I get to be right behind the hearse. When I go to the hospital, they have special parking places for us because they want people that know how to deal with pain to help people that are in pain. But here's the other thing that I know that you're saying, I see the bubbles coming above your head right now, but you don't know about my struggle. Well, I, I know the general categories. You've got a struggle in a relationship between you and somebody else. You might have an intrapersonal struggle with the thoughts and minds and desires of your heart and the things that are going on, and you're not happy with the desires that you have. There, there are also struggles that go along interrelationally, between people that are believers even. You would think that Christ followers know how to respond and love each other. Oh, no. Because we got the right way to do things, and if people just do things the way we want them to be done, then everything would be okay. Some of you are in the midst of financial struggles. And literally, you can go through a financial struggle if you have too little or if you have too much. Ask those who just won the lottery. They have all kinds of new friends. Ask the one that is struggling to pay the next bill that's a single mom or a single dad and trying to figure out how to get it done next. There are spiritual troubles. Literally, ladies and gentlemen, before the end of this service, I'm, I'm going to offer you an opportunity to follow Jesus. I mean, really follow Jesus. Not because your mama or your daddy made this decision for you. We're going to learn today that you can grow up in a Christian home and you can be an evil sinner who does not believe. Just because you grew up in a church, it's just like saying, I grew up in a garage, so it makes me a car. They're financial. They're spiritual. He who has not God has no beginning and works to no end. They're emotional struggles. 
There are all kinds of struggles in your life, so how do you start to deal with them? By listening. But there's somebody you should really listen to even more than me. We should always listen to everything that God has to say from this book. Do you know that two of Jesus' brothers wrote books or letters in the Bible? So why should you listen to me is the very first point today. Because you should listen to him. To him who? Him is James. Look what it says in the scriptures. If you're following along, we have notes in your worship guides. If you're on the app, there's a place where you can press the sermon notes. Fill it out, carry it with you everywhere you go. But the very first thing you should see when I put this point, why should you listen to me, is James and how he describes himself. James, quote, James, a servant of God. Another translation says a bondservant. Another translation says a slave. Of who? Of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he writes to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. He's writing to Jewish believers who have been scattered because of persecution. Once Christ came, he was resurrected. The church started. This man, James, led the early church because he was the brother of Jesus. The half-brother on earth of Jesus. And not only that, he's speaking to these people who now have been driven out of Jerusalem. They're scattered to the ends of the earth because they are upsetting the status quo. They are turning the world upside down. And James is left in Jerusalem to be the head of the church. You're going like, well, how do you know? Um, I've read about a lot of Jameses in the, in the Bible. How do, what do I know about the, the family? Well, there's, there's James, who was the first brother after Jesus. He was the oldest brother. He was the one that worked alongside Jesus in the carpenter shop. And now, how would you like to have Jesus as your brother? I mean, every morning, he told his mom, what would Jesus do? We know what Jesus would do. He would do the perfect thing. He eats all of his Cheerios. He picks up his clothes. He makes A's in school. Straight A, pluses in school. James had lived with that all of his life. But but here's what you don't understand. I didn't quite understand it even before I began researching this message. Jesus had at least nine people living in his house. At least nine. We're told in in the book of Mark and the book of Matthew, Mark chapter 3, Matthew chapter 11, that Jesus had four other brothers. The first one was James, then Joseph, and then Jude, and then Simon. James, Joseph, Jude, and Simon. He had four brothers in his house. We also are told that They're not named. I don't know why they're not named, but that he had sisters. He had at least two. So with Jesus and his four brothers and at least his two sisters and then his mama and his daddy, there were at least nine people in the house. There might have been more because back in those days, children were kind of like employees. You you got engaged. You got married. You had babies because you need to put them to work in the family business. That's how people survived. They kept having babies. It's much like we have in our families today, right? Your children, your employees. And and we know also that that Mary, the the mother of Jesus, also had other children. Despite what other traditions might tell you, you know, Jesus, Mary, Joseph became a family, but it was only the beginning of the family. It says that after Jesus was born that Joseph had relations with Mary. That doesn't mean that they played tiddlywinks together. Jesus came from a big family. And not only that, we we see from the context of Scripture that probably Joseph died young, which means Jesus took over the family business. Jesus was a tough guy. He had guns for arms. He had rough hands from dealing with the rough work of carpentry. And James, his brother, typically because, how many of you come from big families where there's six, seven, eight more people? What, what, okay, good, what happens? The oldest one takes care of the next one, right? See, the next one takes care of the next one, the next one takes care of the next one. So Jesus is like James, not only big brother, he also becomes like a father. And he's in charge of the carpenter shop. And there were nine in this family. So well, well, I've, I've read some of the Bible before, Pastor Ray, and, How do you know that this James was Jesus' brother? Well, because there's James, the son of Alphaeus, who was a disciple. There's James, the brother of John, who's also a disciple. There's James, who's the father of Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but another Judas. 
And we read from the context of Scripture that after Jesus rose from the grave in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that he appeared to the twelve. That takes two of the game. The James is out of the running right there. He appeared to the twelve. Then he appeared to his brother James. So why is this so important? Because James grew up with Jesus, and for most of his life, he didn't believe in him. As a matter of fact, there is Scripture that shows you that that's true. In James chapter 7, Jesus is preaching somewhere, and they, his family comes to get him. They say, your brothers and your mothers are waiting out for you, outside for you. Who's my brother? And my mother and my sister, they're the ones that do the will of God. See, Jesus has been doing this all the time. But, but hold on for just a minute. You've got to stop and think about it and put yourself in James' shoes. Jesus has been doing this all of his life. James was probably born two or three years after Jesus, maybe one year after Jesus. Who knows? He was there when Jesus was 12 years old. He was in the temple. They left him behind. They had to come back and get him. And he said, don't you know I had to be about my father's business? Jesus has been all about doing God's business even before family. But there are a couple of times in Scripture where Jesus is healing the sick and raising the dead and doing great things, and the family comes back out after him. And it's like people, hey, your family's outside. He says, my family are those people who do the will of God. That doesn't mean he doesn't love his family. It means i got to do what i got to do. But you got to put yourself in James' shoes as well. If James is the second oldest brother, James is the one left behind. He's the one running the carpenter shop. He's the one paying the family bills while Jesus is traipsing all over the country with all kinds of crowds following him, doing what Jesus does, always being perfect while I'm here at home stuck doing the work. Are you feeling a little bit for James right now? You been there? You ever had a brother or sister that got a little bit higher than you every once in a while? Remember how that felt? And, and you were left to take out the trash? And you were left to finish the chores? And you were left... And essentially, James was now the father of the family. And so there's a couple of times in Jesus' ministry where his family comes after him to bring him home. Don't you think about, Mama, we got bills to pay, we got jobs to do. What are you doing, Jesus? And stop for just a minute think about it from James' perspective. Come on, bro. You and me. I would argue that James spent more time with Jesus on this earth than anybody else. Mary and Joseph, they kept having kids. They kept having people to attend to. James missed his brother. And I think sometimes he got tired of him being gone. But as we begin this James chapter 1, verse 1, one of the early books in the New Testament. By the way, you can read this book in 20 minutes. I would challenge you sometime this week to read the whole thing. Some of you can read faster. You can do it faster. I'm kind of a slow reader. But what happened to James? James, a bondservant, a slave, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. James has proved you can grow up in a Christian home and still be a sinner. He grew up with Jesus, y'all. He saw goodness and purity and righteousness all the days of his life. And for most of his life, he still, Jesus, doing your thing, man. So what changes with that? You see, that's why we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There was a resurrection. So Jesus appears to the 12. He appears to women. But it also says very specifically, he appeared to his brother James with holes in his hands and holes in his feet, risen from the dead. You know what changes a brother from saying, that's just Jesus, my brother, he's traced around the country to Jesus is my Lord. Resurrection does that. Listen, you know, i got two great brothers. Uh, Two others are in heaven. I love my brothers. My brothers love me. But I promise you, none of us have ever called one another Lord. <laughs> are you with me? And here's what James is all about. James is kind of like the Proverbs of the New Testament. James is like, I'm going to tell you things to do. There are 105 imperatives, commands in this book, and he says, 54 of them are absolutely imperative. He says, listen, you do this and you don't do that. James doesn't really care about what you think. But I, my opinion is that James is kind of like, ah, I grew up with Jesus. I was a sinner. I saw him. My Lord is my brother. And now I have come to declare the truth to you. So I want to do my very best during this series along with other members of our teaching team over the next couple of months to channel some James. To channel some truth. But I think, well, it, 
I want you to think like he thinks because he used to live with Jesus. We're zooming in during this series. Zooming in up close and then zooming out far away. We're, we're zooming in today to trials. And the, the first thing that we need to see after the context of who this one was that we should pay attention to is that we need to learn how to count. We need to learn how to count. Look at these, this verse. Consider or count. It's an accounting term. Count it. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. The word trials and many kinds has the idea of multicolored, all kinds of dimensional trials. Little ones and big ones. Dark ones and bright ones. By the way, if you're in a dark, dark place in your time, in your life this week, I read something this week I want to share with you right now. Barbara Brown Taylor said, Jesus and God does his greatest work in dark things. A dark seed is in the darkness of the ground. A child is in the darkness of the womb. And Jesus Christ was in the darkness of the tomb until he resurrected, until the seed sprouts, until the baby comes, until the Lord is risen from the dead. Jesus starts out in dark things. You going through a dark place right now? I know what that's like. My mom was not just like yours, but I know what that's like. You can come out of that darkness into his marvelous light. Count it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. You're going like, what does that mean? Does that mean... Mama died, I should go, whoa! I just lost my job, I just got fired. <laughs> Somebody in my family told me they don't love me anymore. Yes! I just lost a baby. Oh, I was okay, you have another one? These people are not joyful, they need to be medicated. What does he mean? The word perseverance has a connotation in the ancient language in which the Bible is written in the Greek, which means to stay under it. Stay under it. Let me ask you a question. Any of y'all ever had a big test you had to pass, like in the classroom? Big test. Remember that? <gasps> I'm going to pass this. I'm going to make it. Whatever. How many of you had a big test in your work? Right? Okay, there you go. There's others of you. How many of you have had tests of all different kinds? Let me see. Okay, good. I want to make sure y'all breathing this morning. Some of y'all look at me kind of like an owl. <laughs> See, part of the reason some of us get left at the desk is we don't pass the test because we didn't study before the test and we got to keep going back to the desk to pass the test. Some of you going right now, you know what? I'm not, I don't love the person that I live with right now. Okay, maybe that's the test God's going to give you because he's doing something in you and through you so that you will be the best you you possibly could be. But I'll just try again. Well, the problem with trying again and again and again with one more person and one more person and one more relationship is wherever you go, there you are. So what does the attitude mean? It means... Here's a prayer when you get under something. And you're like Job. If you ever read the Old Testament, Job goes through some stuff. I don't have time to go into it. But at the end of the, at the, end of the book, he's going, I'm going to shut my mouth. Here's what you say. You say, God, what are you up to? This is what to pray. God, what are you up to? Why are you testing me with that? Why are you testing me with him? Over the next several months, we're going to be talking about how to be, deal with being rich and poor, and not, not bowing to the rich guy or what we're supposed to do, how we have faith and how we can learn how to pray and, and what it means and can we be healed. Some of you, that's what it's all about for you. You're going through something right now and you're going, ah, this is killing me. Help me. Give me some medicine. Go through surgery. You want to make sure they got the pain medicine ready afterwards, right? Some of you ever gone to start getting back in shape and you go to the wire, you go to Planet Fitness, or you go to your gym. You got you hear people around the gym going, We're well, not at Planet Fitness, but other places. They're under all this kind of weight. They're going, ah, 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 ah. 
commercial next weekend. We're going to have the world powerlifting champion here who's going to help me to teach, by the way. Pretty interesting, but you need to come back next week for that. <laughs> but the prayer to ask in the middle of your trials, God, what are you up to? Number three, not just learn how to count. Count is a counting term. You learn how to bring it to account. God, what are you up to? I'm putting this down here because I want to see what you're going to do there. Number three, let the process continue. Let the process continue. I love a lot of the stuff and a lot of the people that we see on TV, but if you watch a lot of people that preach on TV, it's kind of like, your problem's going to leave you today. Your stuff's going to go away today. You're going to be rich, and you're going to be happy, and you're going to be successful, and your teeth are going to be white even though they're yellow. went to my dentist one time, and I said, what do you do for yellow teeth? He said, you wear a brown tie. (laughs) Fortunately, I don't do that anymore. Listen. Let perseverance, circle that word if you're taking paper notes, uh, put your finger on it if you're tapping on it in your Bible app on your phone. Perseverance means to abide under, stay under it, stay under it because something's happening inside of you. It says let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything. God has one goal for you and for me. It's to make us like Jesus. It's not to make us rich, happy, successful, living at the right address, driving a certain kind of car with a certain kind of four wheels, or having a stable of all those things. God's not made us just to take great vacations. He's not made us to do great jobs. He's made all those things richly for our enjoyment, but none of those things is what God's ultimate goal is. God has a goal for you. It's to make you like Jesus. Do you have him? Next, ask for single-minded answers. Ask for single-minded answers. What do I mean by that? Look what he says. He says, listen, James, the brother of Jesus, <laughs> ate Cheerios with Jesus, took care of timbers with Jesus, made furniture with Jesus, fussed with Jesus, fought with Jesus. Can you imagine fighting with Jesus? <laughs> James is all of a sudden, mm-hmm. And that's not in the Bible. I don't know how that works. <laughs> Jesus turned the cheek, he turned the other cheek, and he went, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know. We'll see if we get to heaven. James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. You know what he's saying to us here? There's, there's a reason Scripture is put where it is. He's trying to make a point. In your trial... You're going like, what's up? Ah, give me the medicine. Cut me. Get it out of me. You should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. In the middle of your trial, you can say, hey, Jesus, I just need some wisdom so I can get through today. Today's about the present. You can do nothing about yesterday. Tomorrow is a dream. You live in the present. It's a gift. That's why they call it the present. So how do you live when you're in the midst of emotional, spiritual, financial, relational, intrapersonal pain? Jesus, help me understand what's going on here. When I was a kid, I was 17 years old. I had already accepted Christ, but I remember reading the story in the Old Testament about Solomon. And Solomon could have asked for a lot of things, but he asked for wisdom. And then God gave him riches and honor and a great brain and all this kind of stuff. And I thought when I read that, I said, hey, God, I want, I want wisdom. And so I, I literally I had what I felt like a second conversion. I was, I was laying on my bed. I got cold chills and all this kind of stuff. A friend of mine used to call them glory bumps. <laughs> and then God said to me, I'm going to give you wisdom. But it is not what you think. But it is everything that you need. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Hold on just a minute, Pastor Ray. Didn't you preach a message series several years ago about with doubt? It's okay to have doubts, and the main thing we need to do is to pray God to help us doubt our doubts. Yes. So what is he saying? It is only the presence of doubt where we can learn to believe. But, but look what he says. 
that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So what in the world does that mean? Does that mean I can't ever doubt what's going on? Or what? what it means is there's my way or there's God's way. We live in an options open world. I'm going to follow this person, that latest bestseller, that last YouTube video I saw. No, I'm going to follow Jesus because it's Sunday and it's time to go to the point. I'm going to do it my way. And I'm going to, do you see what's happening? You're not going to go anywhere. You're going to be taught. You got to say, all right, Jesus, I'm here with you. I am banking on you. I am sitting in you. I am trusting in you. I'm not going to trust in me anymore. I'm not going to trust in them anymore. By the way, a lot of what we see on television, those people have been dressed up, painted up, shaped up, photoshopped up. So you think they're better than they are? They got trials just like you. Number five, zoom out for perspective. Zoom out. Hey, you know what, y'all? When we are in pain, here's what happens. Our world gets really small. When we tempt, we're tempted to zoom in and stay in our pain, we need to zoom back out and get some perspective. Here's the first thing to learn. Money can't buy your way out of it. Believers in humble circumstances, other translations say those that are poor, ought to take pride in their high position. Hey, listen, there's something about being poor that makes you trust not in how many dollars you got in your bank account or how smart you are or what your degrees say or how big you are because you literally have to learn to trust God for the next day. Listen, if you ever have a chance, go to a third world country. We'll take you. Where people don't know what they're going to have tomorrow. It's just about today. Here's the other thing, by the way. They're a whole lot happier than y'all are. I'm serious. I'm thinking about where you turn, paint off the house. They're going like, what are we going to eat tomorrow? I don't know. We'll figure it out. But, but he also says, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wild flower. And then he goes into more detail. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom fails and the beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Is it because Jesus is pounding rich people? It's no, it's because he's going like, you're going to get to places in your life where your money ain't going to buy your way out of it. It can't buy you past that cancer. It can't buy you past that disease. It can't buy you out of trouble that you got yourself into. Well, most of the time it works. What this says is sometimes it doesn't. So whether you're rich Understand you're going to be humble by pain is what he's saying. If you're poor, thank God that you've learned to depend on him in the first place. Hey, listen, y'all. If you're rich out there, thank God God made you rich. I pray he will ask you to tithe. And you will listen and you will do it. I hope those persons out there that are going to win the lottery one day remember where they can invest it for God's glory in Belmont. But we zoom out for perspective, and then finally, zoom out to see the prize of the trial. Let me ask you something. Can we talk for a minute? When you pass that test, even if it took you two or three times, when, when you lifted that weight, even though it took a lot longer than you were thought it was going to be able to, when, when you, through the hard work of counseling, forged that relationship back together with others or with yourself, When you got the next job, could you look back and say, man, now I understand. Now I get the reward. Now I get it. David Jeremiah is one of my my favorite biblical teachers. He said, you can only understand God's faithfulness in reverse. You can look back at it. But right now, you got to say, I'm going to have faith. Do you have it? 
Look what it says here. Here's the prize of the trial. Blessed is the one. Oh, blessed, if you like King James English. Blessed is the one who perseveres, who abides under that trial. Because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Jesus had a test to pass every day of his life. On the night before he was to give his life, he understood that all of his friends were going to run away. He begged God in the rock, on the rock of Gethsemane, to say, God, please don't make me do this. Is there another way? Please. But not my will, but yours be done. Jesus didn't want to suffer and die on the cross. He was willing to go through crucifixion so that you and me could have resurrection. But here's the other thing you and I need to understand. we got to kind of go through our own crucifixion. we got to get to this place where there's enough tension, enough transition, enough trouble, enough stress going on in our lives that we're willing to say, it's about you, and I'm not going to be blown my way in Jesus' way and my way in Jesus' way. The very first test is, do you know and have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord? Today, on July the 7th, 2019, we're going to give you an opportunity to draw a line in the sand. Well, I'm still keeping my options open. Well, that's not wise. That is, I'm just not going to say that, but today I'm going to offer you Jesus. So, So what? How do you get through what you're going through? By zooming in and out of what Jesus is doing in you in the process of the trial. You zoom in, you experience the pain and the need. And then you zoom back out on what Jesus is doing in you in the process of your trial. So now what? Do the next right thing. What is the next right thing? Today, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your heart against him. Some of you say, you know, I kind of took care of that years ago or last week or something like that, but your life doesn't demonstrate it. You're still doing this. So today I'm going to do something as we close this service and I'm going to ask that believers, if you are a Christ follower, that that you pray this prayer with those who are coming into the kingdom because the words I use are as applicable to you as those who are coming into the kingdom for the first time. I want to ask you if you bow your heads and close your eyes. And everybody, believers and people who are coming into God's kingdom, believing in Him for the first time, praying with me, would you repeat after me? Lord Jesus, today I trust in you. I trust you. I accept your forgiveness for all my sins. Fill me with your spirit. Teach me from your word. Help me live it out every day, every way. Thank you for my salvation. I'm following you now, Jesus. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed and, and there's nobody looking around, what I want to ask you to do is just, if, if you have made this decision to cross the line of faith, if you have prayed this prayer and, and meant it for the first time, I'm just going to ask, and I count to three, if you would, I'm, I'm looking for you. I'm going to see if you'd shoot your hands up. I'm, when you shoot your hands up, I want you to lift your eyes up so I can personally welcome you into the kingdom of God. Would you do that? Are you ready? Acknowledge what God has done in your heart already. One, two, three. Shoot your hand up like you know the answer. Is anybody here that's making that choice today? God bless you, sir. Well, I see your hand. Welcome to the kingdom of God. Are there others? Father, thank you for this one, my brother, who has come. Now let us live it out, God. Let us take what it is that you want to do in us. In Jesus' name.
and for his sake. Amen. Would you stand up, please? So we rejoice with angels in heaven for our brother who is gone from darkness to light, who said, yes, I'm nailing it down. I'm nailing it down today. I'm going to ask that gentleman if he'd please come see me after the service is over. I want to just have a conversation with me. This is going to be an exciting next couple of months as we zoom in on real life, up close and far away. But there's something you can do as well as you prepare to enjoy and apply this series to your own life. How many of you know somebody that needs to hear this message you heard today? It's, it's online to this afternoon. It'll be online later on. But also, there are cards that we have outside, and we invite you. It basically just gives an invitation to the church, the address, worship service times. If you're watching online, you can share this with other people too, but I invite you to take some of these as you go today. Take a handful of them. Share them with people that you encounter in your life at work, at lunch, at home, in your community. Because we all need to experience what Jesus had to say to us through one that loved him the most, real life, up close and far away. Dear God, bless these who come. Bless them now as they go. Help us to be your representatives as we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys enjoy the morning. Go outside, hang out, have a good conversation with somebody on the plaza. We'll see you next week.